Why objects? What's so important about objects? Well, in many philosophies today, you will find objects being the butt of many jokes and the object of many attacks. Uh, and there are two basic ways in which this happens. Objects can be undermined. And I'll talk about the pre-Socratic philosophers in a few minutes. Undermining objects mean you say that objects are not fundamental. You, know, you see a chair, but it's actually made of atoms, or it's made of quarks. Um, you, you're looking for some deeper fundamental reality that explains what mid-sized objects really are. They're, they're nothing important, they're nothing autonomous. You're always going to something deeper. That's what I call the undermining position. And then I coined the term overmining, the opposite of undermining. And that is what you see more often in modern European philosophies, especially since Kant. Overmining means objects are these falsely deep ghosts that you're positing that are not necessary, right? Because why say that there's something there called a chair that's an independent existing object? What's happening is I have a certain experience of a chair. It, it's present, uh, it presents itself to me in a certain way. Or maybe it's a construct of language. Or it manifests itself in perception somehow. Uh, there's nothing un hidden underneath that experience called a chair, according to the overmind position. But what both positions have in common is that both of them skip over objects. Objects are somewhere in the middle, and both positions jump from one side to the other while ignoring and belittling those objects that are in between the two extremes. And that's what I'm trying to oppose. Um, what is typical of object-oriented philosophy? One is that, of course, objects exist at all levels. You can't privilege tiny little microparticles and say that those are the real thing. You can say, I don't even know what a, a blingy, what was it? Oh, yeah, you know, like, a, maybe like you eat a, a, a caviar with. Okay, yeah. I don't need caviar, so that explains it. Uh, but that would be a real object, say an army, a, a society, Georgia Tech, any of these things potentially could be objects. It's not necessarily the case that anything you name is an object. You could name something you think of as an object, but it's actually a pseudo-object of some sort. That's, that's a different question. The point is being tiny, being eternal, being fundamental, these are not necessarily features that objects need to have in order to be objects. Objects have to be unified, I will say. To be, to be real objects, objects have to ha uh, have a certain depth that is not exhausted by all the relations they come into. And those are the main features of objects. Objects also have, a, have to have certain qualities that belong to them. And I will explain in a few minutes why Heidegger leads me to say that objects have to be deeper than any of their relations to anything else, any of their effects on anything else, and so forth. But I also believe there are two different kinds of objects. There are real objects which withdraw from all human experience and withdraw from all other objects into a kind of hidden vacuum. And there's also a kind of object that I would call sensual objects, which are the ones we experience as we look around us, chairs and people and so forth, trees. Okay. Now I go to the Heidegger slide. Heidegger actually hated the word objects. He used it as a pejorative term. For Heidegger, object is what you get when you falsely reduce reality to some model, whether it be a scientific model or a conceptual model. And he even thinks technology reduces things to objects, things that can be manipulated, um, object, uh, things that are reduced to a mere set of properties that can be exploited by humans for their own purposes. But although he hated the concept of objects, he is the one who led me to this position, and I'll tell you a bit why. First, there was Edmund Husserl, who was the founder of phenomenology. He's one of the Austrians. He's actually born in uh, Moravia, now in the Czech Republic, but he was part of the austro hungarian Empire. And Husserl thinks that the only way to save philosophy from the onslaught of the natural sciences, as a result of which philosophy was turning into experimental psychology, is to not invent theories about our experience. You know, if you hear a door slam, you hear a sound, don't say that the door slam is creating vibrations in the air and it's going to your, 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 your ear drum and that goes through your nervous system to your brain. We have no direct access to that. Before we get to that point, we should be describing very minutely and very patiently exactly what we experience. And that is simply the sound of door slamming. And if you're good at phenomenological description, you can find all kinds of subtleties in that. And that's Husserl's that's phenomenological method. Heidegger, who was a student of Husserl, tried to challenge this notion by saying, you know, for the most part, we, we don't experience things by perceiving them. Things are not primarily objects in consciousness, as Husserl said. Why not? Well, because what about the floor you're sitting on right now? Something you weren't thinking about, most likely, until I mentioned it. But you're, you're relying on it. You're taking it for granted. If the floor had collapsed, you would have fallen, you would have been injured or killed. What about your bodily organs? You probably weren't thinking about those unless you had pain somewhere until I mentioned it. There again, you're relying on this silent network of withdrawn objects that you, you don't usually consciously access. 
And so consciousness is actually a very thin film on top of a very much deeper reality for Heidegger. And when do we notice these things? Usually we notice them when they break, according to Heidegger. Uh, the, the bus doesn't come, or your, your computer crashes, uh, you have a heart attack, whatever. Something happens that makes something usually reliable malfunction. Okay, now the way that usually is interpreted is that Heidegger is putting practice before theory. Right, to say that uh, before we can observe something theoretically or look at it explicitly, we're using it practically in some way that we don't consciously recognize. So it becomes a distinction between conscious and unconscious, according to that interpretation of Heidegger. It becomes a pragmatist reading of Heidegger. Heidegger is about, about our pragmatic activity rather than our theoretical awareness, according to this reading. And one of my first breakthroughs, I believe, in the early 90s was to see that that doesn't work. The reason it doesn't work is because human practice does not exhaust the meaning of the things any more than human theory does. If my looking at the chair fails to exhaust all the properties of the chair, and there are properties of the chair hidden in reserve that are not exhausted by what I see, well, sitting in the chair doesn't exhaust the chair anymore either, right? Because there could be certain smells in the chair that animals smell, there are certain electromagnetic vibrations coming out of the chair that maybe no living creature can detect. The chair is going to be a lot more, not only than my theoretical relation to it or my perceptual relation to it, but also deeper than my practical relationship to it. And so uh, my first step was to see that it's actually it's something deeper than practice or theory. There's something in objects that cannot be exhausted by any kind of human access whatsoever. There's something the human simply cannot get at. So it, turned, it started sounding a bit like Kant's thing in itself. All right, but there's another step, and this is the step that's still controversial. And even many people who are taking the turn toward objects these days are going to think this is crazy. It's going to take a few more years, I think, to persuade them. And that is that objects do this to each other, too. All right, objects, I will not necessarily go so far as to say they're conscious, although I actually do think they are in some rudimentary way, but I don't need to make that claim uh, at the moment. What happens, to use the classic Islamic philosophy example, when fire burns cotton? Well, cotton has all kinds of features, and the fire are completely irrelevant to the fire. The fire simply burns the cotton. The fire doesn't care about the smell of the cotton or the exact color of it to where it was harvested from or the price that for which it was purchased. Uh, any of these things can be said to be properties of the cotton, but the fire doesn't exhaust it any more than we do. The fire makes some kind of contact with the cotton because it burns it, right? And so there's a sense in which objects withdraw from each other as well, not just from us. And this was really the key move, because this move completely blew apart the correlationist standpoint for me. And this is even before I met Nea I, I called it the philosophy of access rather than correlation. The philosophy of access needs to be shattered by the fact that all objects relate to each other. And the, my relation to this microphone is no different in kind from the relation of a breeze to this microphone as the breeze blows through the room. Uh, mine may be more interesting. My relation to the microphone may be more colorful and more fascinating to talk about. But it's no different in kind from, from that so-called anonymous relation. And so everything's put on an equal footing. All relations between all kinds of entities.